it's no driving gloves again. No Derek and Will tonight. And to save you from an hour of monotone, boring Professor John, we've invited one of our previous co-hosts back. Oh, that's uh, awesome. Yeah, it's uh, Mr. Sean Yoder, uh, yeah, c- kind of car guy guru. He's been on a couple episodes before, uh, sometimes plugging his racing simulators, which I think they've now went into production. He's a uh, CTO at Nemesis Racing, and I know they've got some of their simulators, and some of them are even out in uh, for public use, kind of. Th- yeah, 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 yeah. We're 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 uh. uh... We're, we're, we're planning on being a 20 year uh, in the making overnight success. That's, that's the right way to go about that. Right. Well, that, that's how most overnight successes happen. I find is, to, you know, after a couple of decades, you're, you're there. All of a sudden people are like, who are these people and how did they get to where they're at? I was like, well, I don't know. Like, let's see. Um, been racing since 1974. That's where it started. So, um, just gave away my age uh, a little bit. I, I was going to say, you definitely look that old. Thanks. <laughs> I appreciate that. Is it the facial hair or is it the lack of hair on top of my head? I just got it yeah, cut yesterday. Yeah, it's, it's as your hair falls off your forehead and lands on your chin. Yes. I, it was. I, did, I had like the really long, like hot rod guy, like fabricator beard, you know, the, the pointy beard that it's the fat face beard, right? Like you, you have the pointy beard basically to get your face to look thinner than it really is. I don't know what you're pointing at. You're pointing at at, at the camera, which no one can see on a podcast. That yeah, was but awesome. I, I noticed you were only you you were only getting my breastus, <laughs> and you probably and, needed needed more and face. It was and, it was, and, and it you was can thrilling see, for me. You, you can see my beard that way. Because yeah, I, your beard's actually longer than mine now, which we haven't been able to say for years. Yeah, um, yeah it is what it is. And thank you for the uh, the Nemesis Lab plug. I appreciate that. We're uh, like I said, we're we're going to be the twenty year, hopefully uh, overnight. Uh, we're we're reaching for upper echelon mediocrity. How's that? I think that's like, what we, I, that's what we all strive for. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I know what we're building is good, and we have certain expectations for what we're doing. And honestly, what we're what we're truly trying to do, there's there's a core group involved with Nemesis that has been involved with the software companies that I used to own, and um, you know, we we love doing what we're doing in in that little niche inside the automotive world. And my goal with all of this stuff has always been to figure out a way to make a decent living doing what we love to do. And I think that's what everybody kind of wants to do. You know, I, I have no aspirations of being a Bezos or, or an Elon. Um, you know, if we want to keep it in the automotive realm, um, it'd be cool. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to, yeah, I'm not going to say that if somebody came along and said, Hey, you know, we got a couple billion dollars. We'd like to buy you out. I'd, well, I'd entertain that. Yeah. You know, I hope you didn't say you know, Elon not thinking Bezos, because remember, Bezos owns a car company, too, or a truck company. It's a truck. Yeah, but it's like it's <laughs> Bezos owns everything, though, doesn't he? Like he's, he's got his hand in a little bit of everything except one one woman who took him for half. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm fairly sure if, if Bezos has his way, eventually he's going to own Tesla anyway. So it, it won't matter. Um and it was Bezos and Elon are both trying to privatize the space industry in their own ways kind of thing. It's I, all that stuff is just it's beyond me, man. I just want to build my simulators and play with race cars and be a happy guy. That's what I'm looking to do. It's a plan. It's not a very financially <laughs> uh, solid plan because uh... <laughs> it's totally a solid plan. Absolutely a solid plan. I, I make money. On the simulators and, and gaming hardware, and we the, the core group that's involved with Nemesis, we all make money, and then we spend it all on cool cars and playing with them. What's wrong with that? I think I have the same business model. <laughs> that's why we're doing this podcast. Yeah. That's um, what... Yeah. More on my new business model coming up in weeks. I've been te- I've been teasing it for a while, but. The contracts are signed, deals are done. 
<clears throat> announcement. I know, I know a lot of it, but I don't think I know all of it. I think you're. I, I think I, some things have developed since the last time we talked that yeah. you're not talking about yet. Yeah, uh, announcement coming in January. Okay. Or, or if you find it, Sean and I next Friday when we're having lunch. There you go. <laughs> um. Geez, hope that thunk, thunk didn't make it to the podcast because we don't do this editing anymore. And uh, you get uh, was it? feedback on that was I don't know somebody fell or died or something in the other room. <laughs> I it's didn't. Great. I didn't hear a loud scream. So uh, I love awesome. the concern. I love the concern. Well, so what do you want to what do you want to dive into other than what you and I are up to, I, semi professionally? I don't know. Uh, I mean, we've talked about a lot of little topics and stuff and things that have happened. And you know, Will's got his own opinion on things, and Derek's got his own opinion th- on things, and I've got my own opinion on things, and. Since Derek's not here, let's start with this topic. What do you think of the new Corvette and its mid-engine? Oh my! I'm actually going to uh, with a, a mutual friend of ours, uh, Gene Rally, and I are actually heading out to Aniston on Saturday morning to get our first live view of the new Corvette and um, basically crawl all over it and. I think I want it. I believe I want one. Um, and I say that because visually it's stunning. At least I think it's stunning. But I, I, I'm i coming at this from a, I understand why they went mid-engine. Um, I am not a Corvette purist. I'm not really an anything purist, to be honest. I just like cool cars. Um, or cool vehicles in general. Um, and I, I really truly think that with the mid engine configuration, it is going to be properly amazing on a racetrack. And you know how I treat all of my cars. I mean, all of my daily drivers end up going to Barber, Talladega Grand Prix, Mid Pond, Autocrosses, um, Tale of the Dragon, blah, blah, blah. I could, I could keep going, but. I like owning cars that that just make me come alive, basically. And I think that vet has all the ingredients to do it. And then I look at an entry level price tag of sixty, and pray to God that the typical Corvette depreciation after two to three years of a new model hitting the the lots applies to this car like it has through the C5, 6, and 7. Yeah. Because I, mean, yeah. I I don't know whether it will, but... I think you'll get the speculators in the beginning. I think, you know, Corvette or General Motors says they're sold out. I don't believe they're technically sold out. I mean, it's kind of like the Cybertruck. You got 100 bucks and you put your name. I don't even know if General Motors required a deposit. to yeah, place How do you order. sell out of a car that, that <laughs> doesn't have a build cap on? Yeah, like it, so. That would be yeah. like... Dodge saying that they sold out of Hellcats, but they turned around and decided that the Hellcat wasn't a limited production car. We'll build as many as people want to buy. That's that's the Corvette. I think that's what Dodge did. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I'm just what I'm saying. Like you can't run out of a car that doesn't have a build cap on. Like they they didn't come out and say we're only going to build five thousand of them. There's going to be a lot of people that want to be the first ones. You know, get them in. Well, technically, it's supposed to be. January introduction, or I believe, I believe actually, so. it was supposed yeah. to be December introduction. I haven't heard anything about that, and I've always said they were never going to introduce it in nineteen. They would always push the inter- introductory date after January first, just because of compliance with federal EPA and DOT laws and that, and things that change every model year. Because even if they sell it as a twenty twenty, it's produced after January first, and they could sell it as a 2021 or however. So we'll see how that one goes. I did hear something uh, in conversation this week about the new Corvette, and I'm I'm just at a loss. I thought this was a great car. I agree with the mid-engine. The pricing's phenomenal, but th- this guy made a point, and he's right. This car's not going to sell. It's going to fall flat on its face for one design oversight. I hope to God he's right, because that makes it even easier for me to get. No, because it doesn't work for you, and that's the whole problem. You can't do a cam swap without pulling the motor out of the car. 
Oh, it totally works for me. I don't care about that. <laughs> but the, this, I whole, truly, this, I don't... this whole conversation was about nobody's going to want the new Corvette because you can't do a cam swap without pulling the motor out. And, and you know, I went out and I surveyed the 80 <laughs> guys I know that own Corvettes and asked how many of them had done a cam swap. And you know what? Two? One. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, I was I was going benefit of the doubt, but I. And, and you know so what? He, you, he did why? his cam swap while the motor was out of the car. So let me go ahead and ask a very pertinent question. It's it's a knock on question to where you just went. So you want to do a cam swap on a car that's already capable of going zero to sixty in two point eight seconds? But you want it to go. Boom, 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 it's stoplight. No, that's un- <laughs> that's inefficient. That's crap. Yeah, I think now the only thing that I wanted to do that that could be considered inefficient, and this is just, it is the five year old Sean that always rises to the surface. I need a little bit of overrun in the exhaust. I need a little bit of burble and snap and pop on downshifts, and when I come off the throttle, I don't know why that makes me giggle like a child, but. I know it's inefficient. I know it's not burning fuel all the way and it's, it's spitting fuel into the exhaust and that's what's causing that. But it's, it's awesome. So it has to do that. That's, that's all I care about. And that's something that I just find fascinating, but I, I know you've had this conversation with me many times on the, your alpha and the chat, how you want the exhaust to burble and on your bar, that's what you liked about it. I loved it. And I loved it. You know, that's what, it, it's cold outside, so I can say this, that's one of the things Fiat got right on the Abarth, I guess, is the the exhaust. Uh, even though they did change it in 2012, it came out one way and it changed to another way. I can't remember the muffler or the lead or whatever, because, but, however. It didn't, have, it didn't have mufflers, it's just straight pipe. Yeah, see, the the earliest delivery cars then had mufflers. They had some sort of resonator muffler because, uh, you know, my ex-wife's got one of the very first ones ever delivered, and hers was just slightly different, and just one of those things they changed. Eh, who cares? But I think <laughs> I think the I wanna, uh, uh, no, I I, I want to make the whole show about Fiat now. <laughs> just just the great. Um, I I can't <laughs> comment a lot about. Fiat right now. Let's just put I know, it that way. I know. I know. Um, they, uh, but I walked into the Fiat dealership in the last, within the last three or four weeks. Or you walked into the Alpha dealership? No, actually, they, I'm there looking at Alphas and they brought me into the Fiat side of the dealership and then left me. And I fi- and I finally decided, oh yeah, I'm going to wander around. And I came came to the the middle section of our dealership is uh, Alpha, one end's Maserati and one end is um, Fiat. And I thought, you know, if you're going to bring me in and I'm looking at Alphas, maybe you should leave me with the Alpha that's on the showroom floor and not the Fiat 124 and the Fiat 500. Stop, but- stop being practical. <sighs> stop with your common sense. Stop it. Yeah, just quit. But there isn't an alpha in the driveway right now, so um, that obviously there should. <laughs> yes, there is. There, there really is. I can pull the curtain back and see one right now. Well, not in my driveway. There should be. So yeah, wait, wait, wait. Do you? Uh, I can't talk about it yet in case it doesn't happen. But I'll tell you about what we're we're trying okay. to find to satisfy. Uh, the okay. the clue I will give the world is. They only made a thousand and eight of them for the U.S. market. But, I think I might know where you're going. Well, you can talk to me after the show because I don't want. And if you're either. going where I think you might be going, I love you. <laughs> I. We'll we'll just go just, on. We'll we'll chat I, after the show. I just got a I got a serious German vibe there. Because I um um. You were talking about the Corvette and some things, and you don't know it, but I've bought my SHO replacement. And the damn thing's got the um, start-stop feature to it. 
which I, what big deal? It's got start stop. So it turns off at stop lights. And when you come to a stop and you take your foot off the brake, it restarts. No big deal. The SHO replacement does or the SHO does that? No, no, this is the car that I'm buying. The, the SHO is sold and going away. And okay, because my Alpha does the same thing, and there's no way to defeat it. Um, Every time you turn the car on and off, you have to you have to push the button to yeah. physically make it not turn off. It, that annoys me to no end. I know it's a first world problem, yep. and I put up with it because Italian brilliance. But I, I'm sorry. I'm, yep. you, mine, you've got to go through a couple of screens to get to turn that off, and I just... Um, it, it, I didn't think I, excuse me, I didn't think I would care that it did that. But what I've noticed is a lot of times I'll come to a stop and then I will try to turn my steering wheel to prep for the next move or the next right. turn. And I don't have power steering. Yeah, I notice really annoying. My, my fan slows down with the heater. You know, when the car turns off, it kind of, maybe it's the car noise or something, but it seems I get a little less output out of the vents and not sure I like that, but I'm going to be stuck with this car for at least six months. <laughs> That's a long time for you and I. I've, uh, January, I'll have had the Alpha for a year. Um, and I'm not tired of that car at all. Actually, to be honest, January, I will have had my SHO three, year, three years. Yeah. Oh, my God. Is it three? Yeah, I'm trying to think. No, maybe That's it's a only... I went. I, a, I will have went out with Zara for two years, and uh, it's, uh, no, it'll be two years. So that's a relic. Even at two years, it's a relic in car ownership. There. Well, uh, what, years what, what, what I ended up doing is I ended up keeping cars for two years, but I had two cars, and I would still buy a car a year. But, yeah, there you go. But with this, you know, new business thing and watching budgets, I've sold the van, and now I've sold the SHO, and I've kind of. See, I'd love to have Derek and Will on because we knew this was going to happen. I bought a, you know, three thousand dollar Mazda five minivan, if you call it that, uh, with one hundred sixty thousand miles, and only owned it a few weeks because I just couldn't bring myself to drive something with one hundred sixty thousand miles on it as a daily. It it let me down one day, and if a car lets me down one day, I get rid of it. And it's dead to you. <laughs> yep. And so I, I parted with the van and I went out and got a, um, and I went out to buy a used car and it was cheaper to buy a brand new 2019 Fusion than it was to buy a 2017 Fusion when it came to payments. <laughs> so uh, I've got a 2019 Fusion now to play with for a few months. And I'm saying few months quite often here because there is pulling her hair out listening to this <laughs> in her car going, you're not going to get rid of that one. Ah, too bad. But You got rid of – okay, so that's the, that's the replacement? That's the replacement, and it's okay, not – that is not what I thought you were going with. Okay. Well, well that's not the 1,008, car, 1008 mo, uh, units car. That's exactly what I was – yeah, that's what I was thinking. I was like, what in the world? That, that, that's, that, that, that's a different uh, excursion. Okay. But um, the okay. now the, the fusions uh, an SE. It's they don't make a fusion sport anymore. I don't I don't get that. But you know it's a one point. I'm going from three point five liter um, twin turbocharged uh, motor to a one point five liter single turbocharged motor. And uh, yeah, 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 the, yeah. I mean, the fusion's a comfortable car. It's it's a comfortable car. I think it's a good looking car. Yeah. Um, the last we had one, but ours we had a two thousand eleven. Um, uh, yeah, that was a different body style too. Yeah, it was. It was the last body. It was the I saw before now, and we had the V. Well, we had the smaller V6. There were two V6s in the lineup back then. I think it was the three liter V6. I think, but that car. I mean, it it was peppy. It rode nice. It we loved that thing, man. It was. It was my wife's company car for a while. Yeah, I've only driven mine a couple of times because. I've still got the SHO, so I'm driving it until it goes away. Right. But uh, <laughs> it's uh, it's kind of weird, and I, I didn't think about it until after I bought this car. I knew it, but I had an Edge a few years ago, an Edge Sport, and my stepfather had a uh, had has had two Edges in his life. The old, what I call, Razor ones with the, the funny grill looked kind of like your bronze shaver or something. And now I bought the Fusion, and I go, oh, wait, my mom had two 
<laughs> fusions of that same era with the big chrome grill thing. I like that. I like the edge. But I like the edge when it first came out. I, I really like the edge I had. I don't quite like the current model and I kind of looked to see if I could find a 2013, 2014 Edge Sport and couldn't find one. So, why didn't you get you one of the last flexes? <laughs> you bring that up to me. I've never been able to buy a flex. I have went have you... multiple times to buy a Ford flex. Really? And it just, the deal never works out, never works out. As a matter of fact, I'm sitting there buying this Fusion last week. And I'm going through the, the, you know, we're working on financing a little bit and, you know, I'm not real happy with where the payment's at. And so, well, what I said, wait, wait a second, wait a second. You, you have a four, you have a 2015 flex with 31,000 miles on it. I'll buy this thing. I said, let's do this deal. And the salesman said, oh, okay. He goes, what do you mean? I said, stop the fusion. This one, the numbers will work. I want to buy this. He said, okay. Uh, he said, you need to drive it? I said, yeah, I want to I want to look at it. He went to get the keys, and there was money down on the vehicle. <laughs> Another wow. one sold out from under me. And believe it or not, at this Ford dealership, I had three. I went there three times to buy different vehicles. A 2008 or 2009 Ford full-size van sold out from under me. A Roush? Uh, uh, went nope. Not, actually, I bought this uh, downtown Ford dealership. Okay. I, uh, okay. And I've never bought at this dealership before. I went to buy a 2014 Mini Countryman, and it sold literally sold hours before I sent sent the email saying let's let's work on this deal. And I have a that, similar uh, recent Mini story. I have a very similar one. Well, well your um, yours was a. a you got screwed in yours. This one. Yeah, did. Uh, this one, I had thought about the car and thought about the car. And uh, I just finally sent him an email and said, Let, let's go ahead and work the deal on that mini. And got the email back. Uh, we sold that three hours ago. <laughs> You're kidding me. So, so this time I I chose a car. They had many of them on the lot. Col you know, it's black. So it was <laughs> even if they sold this one out, they had another one. So. Oh, there you go. There you go. So did we ever? I you you brought up your your fusion has a 1.5 liter powertrain in it. That segues nicely into something that I wanted to talk about. But did we ever finish the what started this entire line of this, I guess, stream of consciousness that we've been going through? Did we ever finish the Corvette discussion? No, you you said you wanted one and liked it. Everybody knows I like it. So okay. Okay. Um, I don't think there was a total review or whatever, and we, you know, we. Oh, could... I mean, if you want to have me back on after after this weekend, I could give you at least a little bit of a hands on. Um, the one thing about the new Corvette that that I'm a little worried about is, I am I am not a little guy, <laughs> and the center console, the way that it it's basically a half wall. <laughs> it goes down the middle of the, the new vet for the center console. And I'm a little worried about me fitting in there properly. I fit in the C5s, three C7s fine. And I think this car might be a little wider than the C7. I, but it's a weird, it's a, it's, it's weird looking. Well, Sean, I'm sure you can figure out the answer on a Saturday morning before you ever get in the car. Because oh, it, sure. as you're looking around, look at the dimensions of the average Corvette owner. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I, I get that. I do get that. Um, but it does, I mean, it looks the way that they have the thing divided. I mean, it, it is... You're not going to drive this Corvette holding your wife's or girlfriend's hand well, while you're, I, while you're I was going to kind of say it's really not designed for intimate um, country drives. We'll say. No, <laughs> but no, not at all. It's designed um, to stay focused on the road. But which I'm fine with. Well, I'm um, fine with it. I, I'm going to say something to you, and you, as soon as you walk into the Chevrolet dealership and you actually see the thing, and next time you see a picture of one. Ferrari Mondial. I yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I've already made comparisons to Ferrari, McLaren, NSX. Um, you know, it's but everybody's made those comparisons, and a lot of people are mad about the fact that it looks like all of the current generation mid-engine sports cars got together and had a little baby, and they called it a Corvette. But it has to be that for reasons. Well, there, um, there there's the justifiable reasons, but. A Mondial is just one of, I mean, it's got the proportions of a Mondial. It's kind of got the same bulges when you take out all the aero. I mean, if you were, you know, if you if you grabbed the, the designer of the Cybertruck and told him to draw the C8 Corvette or the eighth generation Corvette, I guess, as Derek refers to it, because General Motors doesn't want it known as a C8. And he took out all the subtle little humps and bumps, but just kind of did a, you know, he he learned to do a draw a French curve. He, I think the Mondial and the uh, the new Corvette are, you know, kind of you can see some of the Mondial in there too. Are you going to thank less of me for saying that I really like the Mondial? Well, I like the Mondial too, but I, you, I love you, that. I love that car. You and we're I we're agreeing on way too much stuff tonight. <laughs> you and I have the same. Um, fun you know conversations um and i prefer the mondial coupe over the mondial convertible but um i i i I like that car and i everybody that i hear talking are disparaging the corvette design um most of those folks don't have an understanding of what it takes to make a modern era or current era GT3 car or GT car in general competitive on a global scale. And that's literally, I mean, it's, there is no other reason for Corvette to have done what they did with that car. than they want to be able to go back to Le Mans and win. they want to be able to go back to Daytona and win. they want to be able to go back to petite Le Mans and win. they, they're building a streetcar architecture that they can turn into their current generation, I, I'm getting goosebumps just talking about this, and I, I'm not a Corvette guy, but I do love this car, and I love what they've done, and the reasons why they've done it with it. I, I just think it's going to be epic, and it's it already sounds amazing. Have you have you heard the GT? They already have a GT3 version of it testing. I, I it sounds insane. I haven't been too much into the the uh, a, a lot of that off testing or whatever or the you know what you're saying that see i haven't heard the gt3 testing but i think what general motors did with that car and i guess we'll quit talking about the corvette and, you know give you a chance to re- rebut this but they are they people say the corvette is front engined it's you know it, it needs to have the four tail lights blah 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 and of course it shares its tail lights with the camaro now but what the Corvette was was an American sports car and proved to the world that America could, quote, build sports cars. We did it a little bit differently. Now what we're doing is we're dropping a Corvette on the market that will run circles around your three or $400,000 exotic, yeah. giving you, give you a car that's sixty grand that you can go get the oil change for 70 bucks. And <laughs> it's... I think it's doing what Corvette. I, you know, we know Zora that's would Corvette, never. That's what Corvette's always. Zora been. would never have a problem with it. He always wanted a mid-engine Corvette. I know General Motors just would never give it to him. They finally got Zora's dream done. And if the Corvette would have went mid-engine back in the '60s, think of where it would be on on the global scale today. Think of where cars would be today. I mean, I kind of look at it as a game changer in that industry, much the way the NSX was a big game changer to the entry level uh, supercar or exotic car back in 1991. And, yeah. you know, all of a sudden Ferraris got more reliable. Lamborghini eventually got there. Um, you know, Audi got there. It, or, uh, it's so I think the that's. That's one of the big things nobody's I don't see a lot of people talking about that it it's really gonna slap some of these cars around and prove that America can do it and we can do it better and we can do it you know do it for less I mean they could I don't probably, know about they, they I don't know probably, about better but i i it's gonna prove that with that that an American manufacturer can still compete 
yeah. on a global scale when it comes to that level of sports car. And I'm in and, total and, total agreement. General Motors could have sold this car for a hundred grand all day long, and easily. they might not have sold quite as many, but they're making forty thousand extra per car, obviously, or thirty thousand. Here's what I here's what I don't understand yeah. is. You and I have had this conversation before. I've had this conversation with a lot of people, and I know we're, we're prolonging the Corvette thing, but Corvette could have, and I think argu- arguably should have, become its own brand under the General, General Motors banner. And had it done that, you could have kept the front-engine rear-wheel drive version for the purist at – and you know, at the fifty to sixty thousand dollar entry level price, and this mid engine car could be the Corvette Plus or the Corvette whatever you want to the Mako or whatever whatever you want to call it. If you want to bring back a retro name, if you want to make up a new name, whatever. But that could have been this this new mid engine car could have been a hundred and twenty thousand plus dollar car. It could have been their GT3 RS. It could have been so many different things. Had Corvette spun off into its own brand. And I think there's a case to be made for for them to have done that. I'm in total agreement. I think they, sh- I think that should have been done. It would have, we would have created, you know, it would have been a different level, and they, the GM would have had the ability to sell it at a few more dealerships. Uh, you know, the Cadillac um, um, XLR. You know, it was a Corvette. It was built on the Corvette line. It was a yeah. retractable hardtop Corvette. It could have been sold yeah. as the Cadillac Corvette or the Corvette XLR exclusively at a Cadillac dealership and still tied that name together. But I guess we could jump in. We had the episode a couple of weeks ago of that building a brand on a name. <clears throat> and of course, that's going to what Ford said is the Mustang name's recognizable. So we're going to build off of that. And you know, I'm a former Mustang owner. You're a former Mustang owner. Do you have any big opinions on the the Maki? Other than I like it, I like the styling. I think it's as good looking as an F Pace. Um, I even th- I, I and this is gonna if anyone that I know currently hears me say this, they're gonna be like, <gasps> I think the Maki looks as good as uh, Stelvio, and I think the Stelvio is the prettiest SUV on the planet right now. I the Maki has character it's it's bringing some styling cues to the crossover segment that the crossover segment dearly needs like a, my wife has a crossover as her her company car it's a little toyota chr and we love it it looks like a spaceship it's it's its own design it's not bland you know it, and so many crossovers today are just boxes I, and it, i was walking no out styling. of I was walking out of Target the other day, and there was a white Nissan. I don't can't remember. It was a Kicks or um, it's one of their little SUVs, and it was parked right next to I believe it was a Toyota Rav Four, and it was they both were white. And then the next car was a, a um, CRV, and you, you can't tell you, apart. you could almost interchange tailgates and taillights. All of them have the high <laughs> taillights. All of them have the glass. And it really, I've never really seen, you know, them parked together in that way. And I go, there's, there is no styling to them. This is, okay, we want to be able to put, you know, three rows of seats in here, even even if you can't use the third row. We want to be able to put two car seats in here. We want to take that stupid third row and let it fold down, but still have enough room. You know, if you got rid of the third row, you wouldn't need such a high roof line. And and so it'll, you know, fit a mini fridge and a wine cooler or whatever. And that's what everybody designed around that parameter. And then you put it into the computer and out it's going to spit out the same design for everybody else. And they just decide, okay, we want our taillights yellow, red, and red or yellow, red, and white and yellow or white, yellow, and red. You know, that's, that's the difference is the color of the taillights and, it and the order. It blows my mind how bland the road is if you pay attention to it. Like mm-hmm. we, when you go out tomorrow, and I know you do this because we do on at least some level share 
a little bit of a brain, but I pay attention to colors in a big way. And literally, and I, I'm part of the problem now because I have a black car. And the car I had before the black car that I have now was a white car. And, but it, I would say 98 plus percent of the vehicles on the road are white, black, and silver. And that comes back around to what you just said about styling in general. Like the general public wants a mid $20,000 box that gets them from point A to point B that they can put two adults in and two and five eighths kids and two dogs and a guinea pig in if they have to and some groceries. And they want it to last for six years or seven years, no matter what mileage they're putting on it. And they really don't care about anything else. And that I, something about that hurts my soul. And I think that's because I'm pushing 50. And I remember when cars were cool and we had some awesome colors and my, my parents went out and bought, this is a terrible car, but they went out and bought a 1974 AMC Hornet in orange with white rally stripes on it. Because I, as a four-year-old went, I like the orange car and they bought an orange car because it was, you just don't see that anymore. Well, and it's, I, I made that conscious decision when I bought the Fusion. They they had stacks of Fusions in silver and in white. And if you go to the Honda dealership, you can get silver, white, and beige you know, cars all day long. I give Toyota a lot of credit right now. They've got a wonderful blue that they're putting on their trucks and oh, their yeah, SUVs. It's, it's gorgeous. And I looked at the blue Fusion, which is as, about as radical as you can get. You can get a blue, you can get a red... And I went with black because I know black is a very popular color, but it has the reputation of being a pain in the butt to keep clean, which is very, very true. So a lot of people avoid black. I kind of like black cars. I think, you know, I think it's a pretty color, et cetera. But there was an actual conscious color decision made on that car. You know, Dodge has, a, what, a green and an orange available on their pickups. Mm. And I the guess... F8 green is beautiful. And F8 green is it, It's nice to see these little bit of radical colors. And Porsche's really doing a great job of it. So there are colors out there, and you notice them because not everybody orders them in that color. I mean, there's a um, Mercedes a GT that runs around town here in a bright green. It's the only one I ever see on the road. There's probably more. There's a lot of wealthy people in Birmingham that can afford this car. But the green stands out. You see it. Uh, that's why Lamborghinis come in bright colors is because you want to be seen. And uh, my statement I, is... I want bright colors yeah. other than bright red. That's, you know, I, I, red is... Red pops because we live in a sea of of basically no color. I mean, black might have been a color choice for you, but it's really... A, a, a no color choice. <laughs> well, we, were, we were looking at Lex, Lexus R, um, RC 350s, and uh, you know everyone's white, everyone's white, and then all of a sudden I saw a red one, and now they have an orange. Too. Yeah, I was gonna say I saw there's an orange one for sale in Atlanta right now. They have an <laughs> orange, and they have a really pretty blue on those cars. You know the 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 rhyme in the car business that goes along with the color blue on a vehicle, right? Uh, probably not offhand. Blues lose. Well, For, it, I've you always cannot resale. If you buy a blue car new resale, you're going to get killed. Yeah, I've killed. Always, always been told that about green too. Green's a horrible green, color. Yeah, it is. It's uh, tough resale. And if you notice, uh, if you you've done this stuff as often as I have, and I'm sure Sean has, and we assume we're talking to a lot of car people. When you go on Kelly Blue Book or you go on NADA or whatever, and you're trying to figure out what your car's worth. I can't remember, but it's only within the last five or six years they've added what color is the vehicle. And yeah. if you actually change the color, you'll find there's going to be a slight price difference. Might be a couple hundred bucks, but it's a couple hundred bucks uh, just because of how slow or how fast a car will will sell. So it goes back to my old saying or old thought is, and it, the world's proving it. Cars are appliances, so they're they're all the same color as our kitchen stuff. 
you know, for the vast majority of people, they are beige, yes. beige, white, stainless. It's just like if you're, um, what is it, Guy Fer- Ferretti, Ferretti, the the chef, um, Fieri, Fieri. He, you know, he was always known for his yellow cars. And uh, from what I understand, he's diversified some of his car collection colors. But he's a chef, and his kitchen's exciting. He has multicolored appliances and, you know, as loud as anybody commoner gets or everyday person, we buy our KitchenAid stand mixer in these radical colors, teals and yellows and whites and reds and blues and whatever. But our main appliances are this standard stuff. Guy is a chef, and he wants... That's his enjoyment. That's what he gets out of it. Cooking is his hobby. So he has these loud, vibrant colors and things when it comes to, to cooking. And it's kind of what Sean's saying is car people want the loud colors or want or have, have some interest. They don't look at it. They don't look at a car as a refrigerator. Guy doesn't look as a, at a refrigerator like a refrigerator. As a refrigerator. <laughs> <laughs> I've been to Flavortown. Dude can cook. So, um, yeah, it's, his car collection used to trip me out, man. Like, every, it was black and yellow. Everything was black and yellow. It was really weird. Yeah, uh, it used to be everything was yellow, and now he's got into blacks and yellows. And from what I understand, now he's got a couple of reds or something. Um, I don't know. Good for him. Somehow I've been listening to an, uh, a podcast with an old, old DJ I used to listen to, and Matt Farah is a friend of that guy, and then Matt's now been to Guy's house, so they're hearing some some of the interesting stories and some of the parties. And Guy, I was actually just listening to Farah on Joe Rogan today on Joe Rogan's podcast, and it was crazy. Oh, the real like those two together, you, I don't picture them together, but it was re- it was it was cool. Was Before, that just out of curiosity? Was that like a three or four hour podcast? Because three hour podcast. <laughs> because I'm going. Yeah. Joe's always two hours, and yeah. Matt's always two hours. They the kind of guys that just don't shut up. <laughs> yeah, it was a three hour podcast, but it was totally like I was into the whole thing. I couldn't stop listening to it. Well, that that's what I. I found, and it's taken me a long time to start listening to the Smoking Tire podcast because it's two hours long, and I don't want to put two hours into something, even listening at 1.5 or 2.0 speed. I don't want to put that much time into a single podcast. But now I'm making my podcast catcher download those, and it comes up on the pl- you know rotation on Apple CarPlay, and I just... I start listening to it, and I've been on the road a lot. I think I've driven almost 8,000 miles in the last three or four months. I know some of you, that's not a lot, but for me, that's that's a ton. And it's, uh, it's I'm finding his podcast a little bit more enjoyable and understanding some of the stuff that he, he does uh, and talks about. And, of course, he's a watch guy, too, and I, I like my watches. Yeah, I... Don't even get me started about watches. I, if if money were no object, I would have some stupid watches. Yeah, I think I'm I, gonna I'm gonna buy me a little bit of a present coming up when it comes to a watch. Uh, Zara, I'm gonna be buying me another watch. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and nothing got. I I can actually see him right now on camera when he said that nothing was thrown at him. Yeah. So, but she's in the other room. See, I I tell her this stuff on the podcast because she's listening to it in the privacy of her car and okay. she can't hit me or anything. Oh yes, she can. And now it's recorded that I told her it's not my fault. She didn't listen to the recording. Uh-huh. 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 So where, where do we, do we, do we want to go into the segue that I was talking about with your 1.5 liters of fury? You want me to, you want me to set that up or, or how much time do we have left? I don't know where we're at and uh, you control this thing. Yeah, we're about 45 or so minutes in, so we can go a little bit longer if we want to. I don't mind if we bump up over an hour or so. And uh, okay. I, I know where you're going. And I'm... Are, you sure, are you sure you know where I'm going? I, I think you know where I'm going. <sighs> so John just bought a 1.5 liter car. I don't know what kind of power the 1.5 liter Fusion is making. I'm assuming it's somewhere around 200 or 160 to 180, somewhere in that area probably. Um, I'm driving an Alfa Romeo with a little two liter turbo in it that makes 280 horsepower and a uh, 306 pound feet of torque. And the little car squirts really well. It's, it's, it's quick for what it is. Where I'm going though, is the trend that we've seen 
and I could tie the Corvette into this as well, that trend that we've seen over the last six or seven years where manufacturers are back into this horsepower and zero to 60 war on a level that the world has never seen. And I have a, a, I know no one knows who I am, but I have an extensive background in high performance driving instruction, racing and product expert works uh, work for FCA uh, specifically for the SRT brand and the Abart brands under FCA, um, even before FCA was FCA, back back when it was still Chrysler, and uh, with Porsche, and seeing how cars have evolved over the last decade from something that most people could manage to now, you know, we have these cars that are literally 700 to I and mean, some of the hypercars and supercars out there now are well over a thousand horsepower. The new Koenigsegg Jesco is like 13 and some change, I think, from the Koenigsegg fact. 1300 horsepower. Should the general public, and this, this is just something that I, I've, I've dealt with this for a long time. I actually had a part time gig selling motorcycles when the Hayabusa hit the showroom like the original Hayabusa hit the showrooms. And I had a guy come in. I, I was in Norfolk, Virginia. And, you know, our most of our, our clientele were, uh, they're military. And they were, you know, it's a transient population there. Young guy comes in, looks at me. He's like, I got to have a Hayabusa. And I was like, awesome. How many bikes have you had? It's my first bike. That's not the, and, and, That's not the bike you buy for your first car. The Jesco at 1,300 horsepower, the Demon at 840 horsepower on the race tune, the the, the list goes on, the C7 ZR1, 750 horsepower, Um, the new Corvette, 0 to 60 in 2.8 seconds. The general public can't wrap their brain around that. Like, it's... Unless you've done it, that level of performance will turn a normal human being who hasn't spent time behind the wheel doing things like that on a regular basis. It'll turn your brain to mush. And I don't. I, I, what is your What are your thoughts on allowing anyone to go in and just buy twelve hundred horsepower and take it out onto the highway and and they're out there among us basically with absolutely no training whatsoever. It's it, that it terrifies me because I'm worried about their safety and I know it's their choice. I get that, but my God, they can take out a school bus full of nuns. (laughs) It's I don't, I don't, am I right or wrong in that thinking in that it's too much power for the general public to have. On paper, I totally agree with you. There's no reason a non-trained individual should be get you know for sixty grand, you know, say with it, you know, a, a Hellcat or something, be given seven hundred horsepower on the street. I mean, you but, buy a Demon, you can run nine second quarter miles. That is five years ago. You needed an NHRA license to go, to run nine second quarter miles. Yeah. It's just nuts. It's crazy to me. The all, but why I'm not necessarily against it. The numbers are kind of um, baloney when it comes to the real world. Uh, if we were just talking about listening to other podcasts, and it might have been uh, Matt um, Ferris podcast, he might have been talking to Chris Evans or something. I can't remember. Again, I listen to so many of them, but the comparison that was made on that show is they were talking, uh, yeah, it had to be Matt, because he was talking about driving a McLaren 720S on track. You know, 700, 750 horsepower. They, You know, he claims it is. I, I know a guy that used to have a 720S. Great track cars. You know, something about a $14,000 windshield if you do, you know, crack it or something on, right. on track. But it's a great car. And... Matt tries to drive it without the driver aids, and he emits. It's too much car when you turn off the traction control and the st- stability control and stuff. He was talking to another 
a McLaren 720S owner who had a tune on his car and had a, you know, aftermarket exhaust. You know, Matt's driving a, a press car, so that, you know, his is as stock as stock can be, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And this guy said, oh, it, you know, it, it adds almost another 180 horsepower. So now we're talking an 850 or 930 horsepower car. And Matt goes, but I'm faster around the track than you. And he goes, something about, the guy said, well, how are you running the car? And he goes, well, I turn off all the driver aids, blah, blah, blah. He goes, oh, you're crazy to do that. Uh, guess what? You leave all those driver aids on and stuff. It, in a bad situation, you're reducing your power two or 300 horsepower. And the driver aids are, are what, you know, let us do these things. So what um, you're saying is that the driver aids literally negate yeah, the the figure go, go. Or, or or the folks that leave the driver aids in place because I am literally removing the driver aids from my Alpha right now. Like I, yeah. they get in the way. They they totally get in the way. You know, I, I go back to the uh, you, know, you know saying or story where people go. He goes and and he turned the traction control off, and you know it's going to be a bad story from that point on. Now, I, of course, I'm talking... Especially when they're talking about a Gen 2 Viper, because it didn't have... Well, and that's exactly where I was going to go, <laughs> is, you know, when when my father purchased his Viper back in 94, it's 400 horsepower, 400 pound-feet of torque. You know, it was, com was competition for the Corvette ZR1, which was 385 horsepower or 400 horsepower by the end in 380 pound-feet of torque or something. That's virtually what my SHO has right now. And the Viper was always known as, you know, scary, kind of undrivable. You had to respect it. You know, the only reason a Viper is on this planet is to kill you. You're, you know, the Viper's job is to kill you. Your job is to stay alive. And that that's what it comes down to driving a first-gen Viper. But the scary thing about that is that that, that sentiment got out because people bought those cars who had the money to buy them, but no ability behind, or, or just not necessarily no ability, but they hadn't honed the talent needed. Because I've driven all manner of Viper in anger, and they're brilliant on racetrack. They're, they're absolutely brilliant at the limit, if you know what you're doing with your hands and your feet. But that's exactly my point. These cars came out, and it's 400 horsepower. It's unmanageable by the average driver. I hop in my SHO, and okay, I'm, I think it's 385, 375, 385 horsepower, 375 pound-feet of torque. But they've added all-wheel drive to it. They've added stability control. They've added traction control. You know, they've added, you know, dynamic whatever, so that if I go into a corner a little bit too fast, it'll break the rear wheel some and, you know, and help you maintain control of that car. If you took all those driver's aids off the SHO and you put it back to just a front-wheel drive car, yeah, I think it would be unmanageable. You know, I think 200, 250 horsepower in a streetcar is all somebody can really be expected to control without electronics with the and this could be a whole show topic and it's driving me nuts because we've got a 15-year-old in quote driver's ed right now the limited education that they get that way. And, you know, there's all di different ways of expanding on that. And I don't want to, unless go you want to turn this into a four hour show, we yeah. need to, we <laughs> yeah. to table that right now. Well, yeah. I, I don't want to get into it, that. but people just aren't taught to drive. It goes back to even the speed limit. You know, Oh, I can drive 80 miles an hour. The speed limit should be 80, 85, 90 miles an hour. My car will go that fast. And yeah, it's really easy to drive the interstate. I'll tell you that. It's really easy to drive the interstate at 90 or 100 miles an hour. Not a problem. Until somebody does something stupid or something's in the road and you have to do an evasive maneuver and you have no idea how to control that car other than to steer it between two painted lines. Yeah, or you live in Alabama where we have no state inspection and it starts to rain and all the oil comes up to the top and then cars are just spinning on the highway with literally no steering input because there's no tread on three of their tires. Um, yeah, it's so, so it's anarchy down here. I don't think 
so going back to where we got on this topic, I don't think the the horsepower the horsepower wars are always going to be there. They were there in the '60s, it's and they insane and, now. And, and they, well, it, it, we're we're at these insane levels, like you said, the Kona Sig at thirteen hundred. The um, I'm drawing a blank on the the Bugatti. You know, you had the Veyron or whatever. We're yeah, at. we get the, 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 the Vitesse, the Ver- yeah, Chiron. You're, you're talking fifteen hundred Chiron 1, or whatever. Fifteen seventeen hundred horsepower there. You're talking eight hundred horsepower in the Challengers. And yeah, that's a ton of horsepower. I don't think it's any more dangerous than if you go back to a 426, you know, Hemi Cuda in 1971. On, on, it on was poly glass tires. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the, the tire technology is better. You're the the dry again. The driver aids are there. We, you know, they those cars went as fast as people could potentially conceivably um, control them on the road, and then we jump up to here we are 40 years later and we're back. The numbers are bigger, but I don't think the, the education that a driver's required to have because computers manage it all is that different. The, I think my, my, uh, my objection to it is the exponential difference between a 1970, whatever you want to insert there, hot rod, running a 14 second quarter mile off the showroom floor was considered to be rocket ship fast back in those days. Now we have cars. We, we have more than a handful of cars. We have dozens of cars that are capable of 10 second quarter miles right off the showroom floor. And the difference between a 10 second quarter mile and a 14 second quarter mile doesn't sound like a lot until you actually go out and do it. It is, it is a light year of difference between those four seconds when it comes to quarter mile time. And the, the rate at which things can go wrong when they go wrong in a modern car is also exponentially different. Like the, the, the way modern cars put on speed, it's just, it's tough to wrap your brain around, man. It, it and until you experience the difference between a 13 or a 14 or even a 12 second quarter mile and a 10 second quarter mile, the violence quotient when it comes to those two to four seconds is massive. I mean, it's just, I, I don't know. And I, I guess I'm, I'm also, I have my high performance driving instructor hat on when I'm thinking about this too. And I, I just, I like for people to have fun with cars. I really do. And I, and I have fun with cars all the time, but I want to, I want people to be safe, man. And it does, it does scare me, but I get, I get where you're coming from. I do, but I, it still scares me. And like I said, I, I think the numbers are bigger on one, one front, the horsepower front. They're smaller on the other front, the zero to 60 and quarter mile times. But I, I still think the advances in vehicle safety, vehicle control, like you said, the tire technology, the braking technology, it's worlds beyond that. And where I was going to use as an example of where we get stupid, and I hate, I, I pile on this guy a couple of t- a couple of times since his little incident, is, you know, Kevin Hart. He took a car that was built in 1970. Well, he didn't, but he bought. It was done for a TV show or a movie or something. And they stuck a thousand horsepower in this car. And sold it to the the first guy that came along with a hundred and fifty or hundred and sixty grand, whatever that car cost him, four hundred grand, I can't remember. And he drove off the showroom floor with it. And he might have known what to how to drive it because he actually owned it a couple of weeks. And then he lent it to a buddy, and his it was too much car for his buddy because you know Kevin goes, oh, this car's got seven hundred horsepower or something. And the guy goes, oh, geez, I got a Rentec Mercedes that you know I, I've got eight hundred and fifty horsepower in that. That's nothing. And then goes out and tries to drive the 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 Cuda or the Challenger, whatever it was, like he would his Mercedes without any ability of that the the Cuda catching itself like the Mercedes yeah, there's no would. Stability you know, or that, traction or ABS or yeah, yeah that, that there wasn't even any. There was like lap belts. Yeah. It yeah. only had lap belts in it. I think it's crazy. Yeah, you know, and I'm not saying that's the true story. I don't know if his buddy really had a Mercedes like that or something. But that's the thinking you get is, oh, I can drive anything that has 600 horsepower. I know dang well. I I'm not a 
professional driver. I'm not even a good amateur driver. You know, Sean's world's above me in that. And I get afraid of driving things with a lot of horsepower and especially old things with a lot of horsepower because of the driver's aids. I would have a real tough time driving something with 400 horsepower from 1968. But again, like I said, I'll drive my Taurus every day in the rain with that same horsepower. But the technology and everything is just worlds apart. But I'm smart enough to know that, too. You know, it's not, I guess my direct comparison is, oh, the Taurus got 400 horsepower. Your 68 Camaro's got 400 horsepower. I can drive it. No, that's not true. And it's just, I think that, you know, the numbers say one thing and the, uh, you know, the reality is a whole different world there. Where does it end? Or does it? Doesn't it have to end? I don't. At kn- some point? I, I, I don't know, man. I, the, the, the question is, is how far does it go? And really, I don't think it, it, it really will ever stop until we're seriously all being picked up in pods in front of the house. And the, you know, internal combustion engine is relegated to the world of the horse and everybody's on a racetrack. All the cars are hovering and, and go. It's not like jets, of course. Well, the the new Porsche Taycan does have the Jetson mode, you know. I heard that. <laughs> it's, I, does it real? Is that a real thing? I heard that somewhere. It, it real? Is it piped into the interior or is it exterior? Both. You <laughs> you hear it interior and exterior, so the thing will sound like the Jetson's car as it goes by you. And so the Taycan literally. <laughs> Yes, yeah, there, there's, oh there, there's YouTube videos and stuff of that, but, uh, you know, but that goes back to, you know, the sound technologies and such that we ha- supposedly had to be invented. And, you know, I think that's Porsche's nod to Tesla there. It, seems, it really seems like something Elon would do. <laughs> that's awesome. That's that, honestly for Porsche, that is. That's straight up wacky, like that's. That's entirely un-German. What what is going on there? I mean, is it turning over a slightly new leaf or something? You know, that's who infiltrated the company? That's what I want to know because that is such is not German, yeah. Yeah, some some American must have uh... <laughs> had to absolutely had to. Are they having? Who's ever doing the coding probably slipped it in and <laughs> and they left it. Yeah. It was supposed to be an Easter egg. Yep. That's awesome. I, I do have some friends that are still instructing for Porsche, and everyone that's actually had their hands on the Taycan up to this point, they've had nothing but glowing reviews. I, everybody is blown away. I, I will say this before we have to end. I don't know whether we're close or not. I want to drive one, but whoever at Porsche, I, I applaud them for adding the Jetsons noise. Whoever decided it was a great idea to call that thing or at least one iteration of it, a Turbo S needs to be drawn and quartered immediately. That drives me insane. That's, Why? That's a whole nother show. Porsche has their explanation Why? about it. And the biggest joke, you know, even among the journalists are you you go up to the Porsche guy and goes, I want to, you know, I want to meet the guy that designed the turbo for this thing. Uh, That's just a terrible thing. You know, I I don't buy Porsche's explanation. But then again, you know, as well as I do, every Porsche sold turbocharged now. So every Porsche is a turbo. So it's that's fine. That (laughs) one's not. The one that's not shouldn't be called a Turbo S. It's just it's mind blowing to me. Are we are we going to end it there? Are we going to end it on that? Yeah, I think we better. Yeah, we're we're right okay. at about an hour, and I think that, right. that we'll we'll end up going another twenty or twenty five minutes. But this Easily. is this is kind of and uh, part of the new no driving gloves and a way to get episodes out to everybody. We're putting together a list of additional hosts. We have a set recording time, and we're going to record at that time every week from now on. And whatever hosts make it, make it. Uh, there may be some slight alterations because the guy that owns the recording material or equipment may not be able to make that time. But I think in the hun- this is the 106th episode that will be released and about the 112th episode that was recorded. Um, I think I've only missed two or three 
actual recording nights myself. So it'll be a rare thing, but Sean's going to be in, in that rotation of co-hosts, and I've got one or two other people I've reached out to and going to see if we can get some, uh, you know, consistency and a difference of opinion. I mean, I think we all know that where Will and I and Derek stand on everything, and I think people can even, when we hit hit a topic, we know Will's, Will's opinion, we know Derek's opinion, and God only knows what my opinion is. <laughs> but, but mine's mine's all over the place. But we want sure. And we want to thank Sean for joining us this evening. And uh, maybe he doesn't know it, but welcome to the team. <laughs> yeah, thanks for thanks for having me, man. I, I really it's it's great to be back on the mic. It's great to be uh, here with you, man. I, I we've known each other for a long, long time, and we did agree with each other much more this evening than I think we have agreed with each other over the last decade plus. I, so, um, I think when we had lunch a few weeks ago, we agreed with each other a lot too. This is maybe becoming the new norm. Maybe. Well, let me go ahead and throw this out there. What the hell is going on? <laughs> <laughs> what, in the, what in the world? Well, well um, we're in this world where Mustangs are SUVs and electric cars are turbocharged. I, you know. Dogs and cats <laughs> living together. Mass hysteria. That's awesome, man. Well, I'm just going to take my Elia shirt and go have some ice cream. <laughs> yeah, we, we probably should visit that again. <laughs> we definitely should. But We uh, definitely should. Thanks for everybody for joining us. Who knows what you'll hear next week, but um, I'm going to get out of here for the night. Cool. Thanks, John. Appreciate it, man. <laughs>